Today on Founders, we'll be talking to Wanda Campbell, the founder of Cultivare Leadership Development Coaching. Despite having the odds stacked against her, she founded a thriving executive coaching business that is dedicated to helping others advance their careers. She's an ICF certified executive coach, has her PhD in organizational psychology, and her BS in business administration. This is her story. So I think anyone really dealing with adversity um, or a major life challenge, and I think that's all of us at one time or another, could really be inspired by your story. And that piece was actually, for me, really resonant, um, how to connect with and influence others. That's the missing piece, I think, when many of us are just trying to grind it out and be successful. So can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, when I learned to talk, for some reason, I had a very severe speech impediment. And uh, the problem was so pronounced that um, other folks couldn't understand me. So uh, communication was very difficult. And... Uh, uh, what made it really weird is for some reason I didn't hear myself as having a speech impediment. You know, our brains are able to correct all kinds of things, uh, which is why when we talk or we're, we're recorded, it sounds different than it does uh, for us. And the same happened with me with the speech impediment. Well, that's um, so interesting. One of the challenges... It, or one of the, the challenges is that people tend to think that folks with a, a speech impediment, especially one as, as severe as mine, uh, aren't very smart. And so there's a natural belief that, that quite frankly, that I was stupid. Um, and so it took a while, first off, before I figured out that I wasn't stupid. Uh, and it took me five years with a speech therapist to overcome um, overcome that. Uh, that obviously was a very bad time. Uh, other children were not inclined to play with me because they couldn't understand what I was saying. So well, it wasn't anything like they were, were being mean to me. <laughs> if you can't communicate, you can't communicate. Uh, so, you know, it was a lonely time. Uh, I remember uh, walking uh, around the playground by myself, uh, hoping that recess would soon be over so I could go inside. Uh, so, yeah, it was a difficult time. I got over it. But one of the, the lingering problems was that's an important time in your life to learn interpersonal skills. And that didn't happen for me because I wasn't having the interactions that typical children would have. So, um, and that wasn't your fault. And that's the, the really fascinating thing. I have two little kids, as I've told you, you know, I've got a six year old and a seven year old right now. And, um, I see exactly what you're talking about. You know, it's, it's so important to practice kindness and understanding, but also, you know, it wasn't really your fault that, that you couldn't connect with people, but you were just missing that practice and that life skill that a lot of us take for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, you're exactly right. Now, one of the things that was kind of interesting that, that sort of helped me through is figuring out slowly th that I was smart. And so that was my thing. Uh, because I had a lot of time alone, uh, I loved reading and uh, liked doing well. And so that was that was my safe place. So it you know it worked well for me. It saved me. And uh, it it also provided a way for me to excel. Fantastic. So, yeah, isn't I feel like um, that can be a really, you know, eye-opening moment when we sort of discover what our genius zone is. So why don't you talk a little bit more about that, about sort of maybe your educational trajectory and sort of where that led you? Okay, uh, I worked my way through college uh, as a waitress to get my bachelor's degree. 
I got a bachelor's degree in business administration because I wanted something that was practical and that would get me a good job. And so that seemed like the way. And uh, after getting that, I worked for five years um, with the government as an investigator, which used analytical skills, uh, which was a major part of my life. Uh, went back to graduate school and uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, the university uh, accepted me pre-masters into a PhD program. Um, they told me to apply for financial aid. <laughs> that was kind of weird, uh, but I did. And they gave, they put me on a research grant day one. Uh, I was on research grants the entire time I was there. And that is, for those of you that don't know, that is quite an honor in academic circles. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I was the, the chosen one. Uh, one, one of two chosen ones. My best friend was the second one. Uh, but yeah, we we got virtually always. I think I got a B once in uh, three and a half years. Uh, we were always the top performers and we got all of the rewards. So uh, that was an interesting time. And actually, that's a time when it started to come to light that I think I, I always knew that I did not have good interpersonal skills and um, most of us think that you're born with them and you either have them or you don't. Um, and quite frankly, in an academic area, if you're really good, you don't need them that much. You know, I, they kept renewing the grants even though everyone knew that my interpersonal skills left something to be desired. So can you sort of can you sort of hide when you're when you're in that position? Well, you know it bothers them, but what they really care about is how productive you are and how good your work is. So that can hide a lot of things. Uh, and you know I I knew that it was working, and so I really had no motivation to change. And one time. Um, this was probably the last year that I was there. Uh, a faculty member told me that the other graduate students did not want to work with me. And I swear, the first thing that occurred to me was, and the problem is... <laughs> <laughs> Now, I did have enough emotional intelligence not to say that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, that's what I'm thinking. You know, I'm getting all these rewards. Well, what does it matter? Why uh, do we need to work together? Yeah. You know, it, this is not about collaboration here, uh, at least where I was at that moment. But it did, it did have an impact on me. And when I did my internship uh, with Verizon, uh, then Bell Atlantic, I started to watch what was happening politically with different leaders. And what I noticed was that those who had uh, really good interpersonal skills tended to move up more quickly than other folks. And some of the people who were very, very smart and had wonderful technical skills got sidelined. And so I said to myself, hmm, I guess maybe, maybe the faculty member was right. Maybe this is my next sort of transformation as a person. I mean, I remember I had a similar thing happen to me and it's kind of embarrassing, but at some point in my career, someone actually gave me the book, the classic book, How to Win Friends and Influence People as sort of a subtle sort of, hey, you might need to read, to read this. <laughs> so I can really relate. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that, uh, that, that is a good book. Um, what, and I probably should have just read that, but for some reason that didn't occur to me. And um, as a psychologist, I watched people. And I, I worked 
what didn't work. Uh, there were some things people did that were not something I could pull off. I mean, it was not my personality and it would never happen. Uh, so I just focused on those things that I could do or that I felt were comfortable or authentic to me. And, and just, if we fast forward to today, um, today you connect so well with people who are super smart, high achievers, these quantitative analytical types. I mean, I think the future leaders, because that's where everything is going, you know, especially with the internet and all this metadata we have access to. So, you know, these are the up and coming leaders of today that you now work with very successfully through Cultivare. Um, you know, in my experience, these also tend to be super conscientious people. Um, so, you know, how did you get so so good at, at that? And, um, you know, what areas do you specialize in? Okay. Um, I specialize in folks that are highly analytical. Uh, what are commonly referred to as STEM careers. Uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, but it's not limited to those. But I have a special or feel a special kinship to individuals that are highly analytical. Uh, I connect with them. I understand them. We have a great deal in common. Um, I, like most of those people, or virtually all of them, have very high standards. I have worked and continue to work very hard to achieve my goals, which is another thing that we have in common. And um, I think logically. So, you know, I'm good at data analysis. Uh, I'm fairly good at coming or solving problems that are not quantifiable. And what I found as I evolved was the thing that I really loved was trying to figure out solutions to problems that where there seemed to be competing objectives. And so I basically learned or discovered that the harder or more difficult the problem, the greater the exhilaration when you solve it. It's like, oh, wow, this is really cool. I love it. So. Is that the truth? <laughs> I mean, I, your story, I mean, it, it, oh, it just gives me the chills because I think that when anyone's having a real difficulty, um, it just makes sense, you know, if they're having difficulties with influence um, in their career, it just makes sense that they work with you. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I can offer them is one that I am on, that I understand them. And I don't judge them. And I'm very much aware of the challenges they face because I have lived through that. And um, at this point in my life, I, I'm really focusing on purpose. And it's very important to me to help these folks um, to find themselves and, and be successful. Uh, these are very bright people. I love working with bright people. Uh, they are hardworking. Um, most of the ones I've dealt with have uh, absolute integrity, and that's important to me. And so anything that I can do to help them be more successful, it's great to, be, uh, to help them negotiate the path. Uh, they work hard, and it's so wonderful to see them evolve and see all of their hard work uh, make them successful. Uh, they're the ones doing the hard work. I'm just helping them along the way. Super. That's That's got to be so gratifying. Um, another question I had for you, and I, I keep looking down at my notes because I want to make sure we cover it all, but... Um, you know, you have, you've gotten to the point where big organizations are lining up to pay you for your services. And I just wanted to talk a little bit more in a little bit more detail about the tools, the resources, and the process that you go through with your clients to make them successful. Okay. Uh, first thing is everything I do is customized. Uh, I, maybe it's the analytical thing. You, reckon, you want precision. 
And so it's customized based on the needs of a client and their resources. Um, there are, I guess the thing that I like to do most often is what I call a narrative uh, 360. The 360 is talking to uh, your boss, your peers, your direct reports. Um, and so the way I do this, which distinguishes me from most coaches, is I conduct interviews with those folks. And uh, what I like about that is that I can get details and specific information about areas where people can improve. And that's more valuable than saying, uh, as the faculty member said, you know, you don't have interpersonal skills. Well, duh, I knew that. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> give me something that I can hold on to, something that's gonna help me um, see what I need to work on. Right. How do you quantify? How do you quantify? I mean, that's that's the tough part for an analytical person who falls short in an area that almost you feel like you can't quantify. So you help put that into quantifiable terms for people, it sounds like. Well, yeah, what, what I do is sometimes uh, it's just a matter of giving people some examples uh, of what might work. And so uh, they'll tell me about a conversation and then I'll give them some feedback. And part of the question is always, well, what would you say? And I give them some examples. So in that case, it's a matter of teaching them what I learned by watching other people. So passing that on, uh, do that. Um, because I'm uh, a psychologist, I have access to some high powered assessments that are not readily available. And uh, depending on the need, the client and I identify what we're going to work on and what we're going to use. And if they have already taken assessments that they think are valuable, we'll use that data. Super. It, and you are, you're laser focused on what you do for your clients. Um, what would you refer someone to another specialist for? Well, um, I would start off with life coaching. I know that's important and occasionally people's interpersonal or their personal life does come into my conversations, but that's not my goal and that's not the goal of the folks that, that want to work with me. There are a lot of people that do that very well and I'm just not one of them. Uh, even though I'm a psychologist, as an organizational psychologist, not a clinical psychologist, I don't deal with mental health. So I would refer that. Um, if, if I can't help someone, then I don't want to waste their time and I'm certainly not going to take their money. So that is so important, yeah, to define you know what you do and don't do for people so that you can maintain your focus and your expertise where it needs to go. And I think that also helps anyone understand you know exactly why they should hire you and what they should hire you for. So thank you. Um, so why does your typical client hire you? Maybe just you know a brief overview. I mean, it sounds like obviously they have, someone in their organization or maybe a group of people that they want to sort of cultivate. Hence, you know, the name of your leadership development program. Yeah. Uh, people come to me having problems, which they think are other people. And sometimes they are. Okay. It's, uh, there's, uh, more than one person involved in the problem, but, it's not always clear to them that there are alternative ways behaving that might get them results that are more to what they like. And so part of what we do is we decompose what has happened or we break down or analyze what has happened and we suggest alternatives. Um, life is dynamic and what sounds good in the moment 
may need some refinement later on. And, and that's part of the whole coaching thing is that we identify what the person can do, what they feel comfortable with. They try it out. We figure out whether it worked or not and how to adjust. That's great. So we also kind of talked about theater as a coach because let's face it, you know, there are other alternatives to leadership coaching um, out there. So what do you offer, Wanda, that no one else can? Um, I have been where they are. Actually, I've been far. I've never had a client that was, uh, that needed help as badly as I did. So <laughs> that, that was, that's one of it. Is that, um, I, I, I completely understand where they are and, and that's really important. It's, uh, it, it's critical actually. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, I have figured out how to do it. I uh, have worked in business. I had responsive profit and loss responsibility for a nationwide employment testing program. I did a turnaround. Uh, I got rid of staff, which is very difficult. No one likes to do that. I finally... <laughs> Yeah, it's it's really bad. It's like getting a having a part time job, uh, just with that. Not to mention everything else. I did ultimately get a wonderful staff, and um, gave them a lot of autonomy because they were very good, and uh, expanded, and it was wonderful. You know, uh, they were doing well. The clients were happy. The money started pouring in. Uh, we had the Great Recession, so I got to experience what it's like to manage through a recession. I was able to keep all of my professional staff. And where everyone, while everyone else was cutting back, I invested my folks in resource in research and development. And by the end of the recession the uh the products and the services were done and they were ready to be sold and that's fantastic i mean that whole story in and of itself it's so neat because i think when you talk about who you were as a young person and then where you ended up you understand the people that you're coaching um because you've been there but then you also understand their managers their you understand the direct reports and you also understand the CEO of the organization because of those, you know, turning around a company in terms of profitability. So you understand the top and you understand, you know, those that, that might be being groomed for those top positions. And I think that's so important, you know, bringing that all together in one person. I think it's really rare. It is. Um, a lot of folks who come into coaching have come in from areas that so, that are more supportive kinds of positions. Uh, a lot of folks with experience in coaching and, or social work or things like that, which is good. I mean, those are important skills. Uh, they're skills I had to go back and get trained to learn. So uh, sure. I value those, uh, but. I have never lost my business focus. I've never lost, uh, you know, the client is the most important person. And even if they're wrong, they're still the most important person and you've got to find ways uh, to meet their needs. So yeah, you I get it. And that's why you get hired. I, in my opinion is because you understand the bottom line and that's what your the person who's hiring you is looking for someone that gets that. So, I think that's really neat. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing is it's really clear to me how much you love what you do, Wanda. Um, you know, leadership development coaching. And maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, your love and your passion for what you do and what it allows you to sort of have in your life. Well, I'm at the stage in my life where, as I said earlier, I'm all about purpose. I want to make a difference. And so 
if I'm going to put my energy into people, I'm going to put my energy into people who are very smart, who are hardworking, who have integrity, who are going to make the world a better place. Uh, I also take time to work uh, in for an organization in Washington that works with homeless people. It's called Some So Others Might Eat. And so I coach some of their leaders because the more effective they are as leaders, the more they're going to be able to be of service and the more effective, effectively they're going to be able to help uh, individuals who really need a great deal of help. So that, that's what life is like for me. That's fantastic. And you're able to take what you do into sort of a humanitarian aspect as well. And I think, you know, we're both self-employed people, so I can completely appreciate that as well because, you know, transforming that into your purpose in this world is everything. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, now is the time to worry about legacy. That's great. That's great. Well, this has been fantastic. I think I've learned so much from you, even more than when we first sat down together. So I thank you again so much, Wanda, for your time. Thank you so much for your time, Amanda. Uh, I always enjoy talking with you, and uh, this has been uh, a great experience. Thank you so much. Likewise. We'll talk again soon. Take care. Take care.